Welcome to the fourth episode of Talks with Dalit. My name is Akshita Maheshwari and I am the content and growth lead here at Dalit. We have with us Varun Fatehpuriya, the founder of Dalit. Dalit is a tech-enabled, all-in-one solution for Indians to invest better and reach their financial goals. Before Dalit, Varun also worked with some of the biggest investment institutions like Bloomberg and Blackstone. He graduated with distinction in finance and information system from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He is also a NSIM certified investment advisor. We are glad to have you here with us, Varun. Thank you for having me once again, Akshita, today, and I look forward to this podcast. Thank you. So today we'll be discussing about how to invest internationally. A lot of people want to, uh, you know, allocate a part of their funds to international uh, funds, but they don't know how exactly to go about it. So uh, let's have a discussion on that, and let's try to understand uh, and get some more clarity. So Warren, uh, first and the foremost thing, could you tell us something about why we should inter- uh, invest internationally? Sure, Akshita. So I think mutual fund uh, or even investing in the capital markets definitely. uh took a big shake up in the last 2 to 3 years due to covid a lot of people got into the markets primarily uh wanting exposure outside of the traditional financial instruments like a fixed deposit or a bank deposit or a ppf and all of those things right and because they saw an avenue which was i would say much more efficient uh than other asset classes where they were traditionally invested and domestically a lot of the investors had done just fine right i mean they were investing in mutual funds or stocks uh, whether by themselves whether through a distributor and an advisor and through these pooled investment vehicles obviously they got exposure to i would say instruments that were not easily accessible let's say even 5 years back or 10 years back now that's on the domestic side of things where uh, obviously people tend to have a home bias uh, people are well aware of the companies which are listed in the stock market so whether they want an exposure to that uh, to that directly or indirectly uh, is secondary but because they are familiar with what's happening in the indian economy what's happening with the indian companies they are much more i would say at comfort at ease to take uh, and invest and participate uh, in the growth of those companies but i think people also due to that tending to shield themselves in into a box where they were not looking for opportunities outside of the domestic region and i think that's where exactly uh, investing internationally uh, comes to the forefront uh, so there are primarily i would say four key reasons why you need to invest internationally and i would take uh, help of the slides that we have prepared for the benefit of the audience today uh, to guide you through as to why you need to keep uh, investing internationally outside of the domestic markets and how that could potentially i would say uh, help you diversify your portfolio so just allow me to share my screen today yeah great so as i was talking uh, definitely international investments are becoming a greater portion of an investor's portfolio but there are four key reasons why you need to invest internationally number one and most important is diversification um and diversification in and by itself is not something that will i would say guarantee you profits or guarantee you returns but it will give you exposure to industries it will give you exposure to asset classes to geographies uh outside of the traditional markets of india right so think of it as th- this way rather than putting all of your eggs in one basket what you are effectively doing is putting these eggs into multiple baskets so that no one single basket or your entire portfolio is actually affected in a similar b- manner by the same set of events so for example let's say something like a covid which had come or what we had seen in the last uh one year of the 2022 volatile market right indian markets performed really differently from the markets in the west in the us in the europe where they were down drastically but the indian markets were sort of shielded 
in a much better manner. So that's number one. Diversification gives you access to industries, gives you access to asset classes and geographies, which are not available today in the Indian markets. And at the same time, making sure your portfolio is well diversified across different asset classes. So that's number one, diversification. Number two is protection from currency depreciation. So as an Indian investor, uh, most of the Indians, I would say, are used to uh, their currency being depreciated against the major economies like the US and the Euro. So by investing a small portion of your portfolio internationally, you are also, number one, hedging your currency exposure, and number two, potentially benefiting from a depreciation in the rupee itself. So let me give you an example. Let's say if you were invested uh, 100 rupees uh, outside in the US markets um, at a 75 rupees uh, INR USD exchange. Once, uh, uh, so, so, so that would have bought you an X number of stocks, uh, let's say three years back. Now, if the currency depreciates to 80 rupees, that same set of dollars now will give you a much higher rupee return, right? So what you are seeing effectively being paid out here is by being invested in markets where traditionally we have seen that the Indian rupee has depreciated against that currency. You stand to actually benefit from that depreciation. So that's number two, protection from currency depreciation. Number three is ability to generate higher returns. Uh, I think some of the biggest... Uh, companies in the world are not present in India today, right? Think, for example, biggest technology companies. And these companies had done exceptionally well during the bull run of 2020 and 2021, right? Uh, delivering returns in excess of 15 to 20%, even at an index level. So it also allows you to basically invest outside and be able to generate much higher returns than what you would be able to get in the Indian markets. Having said that, that is not always the case. There could also be times where uh, those markets tend to significantly underperform. But at the same time, because if you are investing from a longer term point of view, you can very well be assured that you will have a much rather smoother investing journey by being invested in markets that do not perform uh, in a similar manner at the uh, same time. So uh, that's number three, ability to generate higher returns. And number four is access to different industries. As I alluded to previously, some of the biggest uh, companies in the world, uh, that could be technology companies, that could be semiconductor companies, that could be biggest financial institutions in the world, consumer companies are perhaps not present in India. So this also allows you to get exposure to companies, allows you to get exposure to industries which are not present in the Indian markets and stand to, again, potentially benefit from that. So these are the four reasons why we think you need to invest at least a certain portion of your uh, equity portfolio uh, internationally. All right, got it. Now that it's clear that there is an incentive to invest internationally for these reasons, the next question that obviously follows up is, which are the countries in which we should uh, you know, invest? Which are the markets? So, Akshita, I would say three of the biggest uh, countries and geographies, which typically we have seen most of the investors actually tend to go towards are US, China, and Europe. And the reason for that is obviously these economies, these geographies tend to be a lot more mature, number one. And then there is an existing ecosystem present in those countries where you could take exposure to their capital market. So obviously Europe and US uh, tend to being developed economies, developed geographies, have a much easier set of capital markets where foreigners could come and invest money. China tends to be a bit different uh, where you need to typically take exposure to any of the economy, uh, sorry, companies that you want through a fund. But at the same time, there are a lot of funds uh, which are domiciled offshore through which you can take exposure to high growth Chinese companies. So these are basically the three economies which we are seeing currently uh, popular amongst investors. Having said that, that is not to say that other, uh, I would say, geographies or economies are not well represented. Uh, it's just that there is a certain level of familiarity uh, with these economies given their transparency, uh, given their level of reporting, given their, uh, I would say, standards. Uh, due to which people at least want to uh, get into these countries. I think that's more applicable for at least US and Europe, 
China definitely still has a lot of catching up on the transparency and the regulatory point of view. But people still want exposure to that economy, given that it's the second largest economy in the world. And uh, you really need to have China uh, uh, if you're investing internationally, at least a certain uh, uh, percentage. Again, what allocation that you have to each of the economies really depends on the kind of exposure, the kind of time horizon, the kind of view that you have in each of these uh, about these geographies. But uh, these three, uh, I would say, uh, economies uh, are most well represented in our country. So, uh, Warren, could you please tell me a little about the allocation of the equity portfolio? Like, for people who are planning to invest in international, what is the ideal allocation? Yeah. So, again, this is really important, right? So, once you have decided that you need to invest internationally, once you have decided that this is something that you want to do, now we need to understand what portion of your portfolio actually needs to be invested in these funds, right? I think when the markets are really performing uh, with the bull market run that we saw in the last two to three years, everyone everyone wants to increase their exposure to these, uh, I would say, uh, funds and uh, geographies and countries. But the moment we see a downward trend is when we start to realize, uh, you know, maybe we need to take a step backwards. So rather than doing that, why don't we, uh, let's say, on day one itself have a an exposure out of our equity portfolio uh, and carve that out for international exposure. Uh, and that, that's really sort of like, I would say, a good spot. So what you see in the screen is basically a sample 80-20 portfolio, right? Where 80% of your money is invested into equities and 20% of your money is invested into debt. Out of that 80%, you could allocate roughly about 10 to 15% uh, of your money uh, into international funds and the balance 70% can be um, I would say invested uh, domestically, whether that's through mutual funds, whether that's through direct equities, that is uh, for you to decide. Uh, but about having a 10 to 15% exposure from a diversification point of view, from a risk management point of view, uh, is I would say a good rule of thumb. So try to keep, uh, I would say, your international exposure anywhere between that, but also see that if you are able to take that uh, sort of a risk by investing uh, abroad because sometimes the market could you know be really volatile uh, outside as well okay so uh, i mean what exactly are the options that are available to us you know to invest internationally if you could discuss a little on that so there are primarily i would say two options that are available to investors uh, in india today right you could directly invest uh, in the stocks uh, of international companies so let's say for example you like Apple, you like Tesla, you like Google, you want to get an exposure to these uh, companies, just like how you would buy a stock of a TCS or a Reliance uh, or a Hindustan Unilever in India, you could pretty much do the same way uh, by investing directly uh, in those stocks. So that's number one, where you are taking your own decisions and you're uh, directly investing in those companies. The other and a much more, I would say, efficient way from a tax perspective from a cost perspective are international mutual funds uh, which are present in India today which allows you to get exposure to I would say funds present outside the country so that could be US that could be Europe that could be China and those funds in turn basically then further invest in all of those international companies so again similarly how you would invest in a domestic mutual fund which further invests in different stocks and companies these international mutual funds also which are present in india you have to invest them in a similar manner as you would invest in a domestic mutual fund by parking your money uh, in rupee uh, and then the fund house doing the rest by investing either in mutual funds outside or in exchange traded funds uh, outside so these are basically the two options uh, and this is how basically the process for direct stocks looks like right so you as an indian investor first need to open a foreign brokerage account right where you need to put in inr and convert that into usd so you need to also be sure of the currency conversion charges that you are paying on every transaction right so let's let's say if you want to buy one lakh worth rupees of uh, stocks in the us markets so first you need to deposit one lakh rupees convert that into usd at the uh, conversion rate whatever the brokerage house charges and then use that brokerage account to further invest in companies outside so it's very similar to i would say investing in companies in india where you need to open a dmat account but in this case you need to be opening a brokerage account with a foreign broker uh, 
and uh, making sure your account is funded in uh, USD and not INR. So that's the process for direct stocks. The process for international mutual funds tend to look a bit different where you are investing in INR and giving that money to an Indian fund house. So let's say if you want to invest in NASDAQ, which represents uh, the 100 biggest non-financial companies in the US. So what you would effectively do is just how you would invest in a domestic mutual fund. You put in 1 lakh rupees into this fund house uh, and then the fund house takes care of the rest where they basically uh, do the conversion, then invest in mutual funds or ETF units outside. And the redemption process also pretty much looks the same that once you want to basically redeem your investments, you typically put in a redemption order and the money comes into your bank account in INR and not USD. So as you can see, I think both of these uh, investments option tend to look a bit different from a process point of view. Uh, that is for you to decide again at the end of the day uh, that if you're more on the risk taking side, you could pro probably play around with direct stock, but you want something which is a much more easier manner of investing then international mutual funds are something that you could easily consider. Okay. So you just discussed the risk, risk aspect of both these options, but if you could uh, elaborate a little on, you know, the pros and cons for both these options uh, for our audience. So again, the pros and cons for, again, both of these options look very similar uh, compared to, let's say, uh, investing directly in Indian stocks or domestic mutual funds, right? Uh, with a bit of a caveat in terms of the restrictions that uh, the regulator, the Reserve Bank of India has placed on uh, international investing. So direct stocks uh, tend to have, I would say, three major pros, right? Number one, there is a flexibility in stock selection. You could obviously select uh, the stocks which you like, which you think would uh, perhaps uh, do the best over a medium or a long-term period. And then there is a customized portfolio construction as well because the entire onus is on you to actually select stocks and then go about with the portfolio construction and you're not sort of depending on any of the fund managers to do that. So you have complete control over how your money is being invested. Uh, and number three is the lower holding period for availing uh, beneficial taxation when investing directly in stocks. Right? And this is something that we'll come uh, at a later part in the episode where we talk about how uh, I would say both of these uh, processes are taxed differently. Uh, but this is something that you need to keep in mind and be very mindful of because tax and brokerage and currency charges can actually significantly eat into your returns. So do not just look at returns uh, at a pre-tax, pre-cost basis. Always consider that given that you are actually remitting money outside uh, to be able to actually come to a final decision. So that's on the pros. I would say one of the biggest cons for investing in direct stocks is the costs that are associated uh, with currency, with brokerage uh, on every transaction that you do, right? And a lot of the people actually do not take into account. So I would definitely urge you to actually think about all of these costs before taking any decision. Number two is RBI has placed an upper limit of $250,000. So that's roughly be about two odd crores that you can invest uh, outside uh, annually. Uh, right. Uh, so this could uh, be, let's say, if you're a parent, you have sent your child abroad. I think this, you also sort of like come into the liberalized uh, remittance scheme where there is a cap of $250,000. Right. So there is definitely an upper limit beyond which you cannot actually, um, I would say, remit money apart from a few cases. And number three, which came in uh, at the most recent budget is there is a tax collected at source of 20%, right? So let's say if you're investing 100 rupees or if you want to invest 100 rupees, the 20% will actually be deducted and you can only put 80 rupees to work, right? Now, this 20% is effectively not a, uh, a tax in the sense that you can always uh, claim it uh, when you file your returns, right? But uh, that's, that's basically just adding another friction uh, and putting less money to work. And this is something that I would say definitely is hefty uh, uh, and that something would deter a lot of people uh, from actually directly investing in stocks outside. So that's basically the pros and cons for direct stocks. The pros and cons for international funds are a bit different. Obviously, I think the pros are that there are much lower costs due to no currency, brokerage and all of those charges. Just like how you would invest in a domestic mutual fund, investing in domestic companies, you just do that in a similar manner where you uh, put money into a mutual fund here uh, and just pay a small expense ratio. Number two, obviously, it's easier and hassle-free. You don't have to worry about all of these transactions with that single, I would say, investment account 
you can invest domestically and internationally you do not have to worry about you know opening separate uh, brokerage accounts uh, then funding that account with INR converting it into USD uh, then 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 basically investing outside and number 3 yeah. is uh, there are no upper limit and gcs on transactions right? there's an upper limit as an industry yeah. level which has been met at 7 billion dollars but there is still room at the etf level for you to invest so i mean typically for uh, as an end investor it doesn't really matter uh, right so long as you're getting exposure to those uh, uh, companies and on the cons obviously i think the same set of cons apply that would apply to a domestic mutual fund that there is no flexibility in stock selection uh, obviously there is a higher holding period to avail beneficial tax, uh, taxation and there is an industry wide limit of 7 billion dollars for investing in units of international mutual funds which has been breached last year mm-hmm. and uh, ideally the regulator i think is working at this point in time uh, in increasing that uh, upper limit all right that definitely clarif- clarifies a lot of things uh, but um, could you probably talk about you know some taxation norms related to these options uh, that would be really helpful for the audience so this is something that's really important for a lot of people to understand that taxation actually plays a key part in your decision making you absolutely need to understand how taxation works before you able or uh take any of the decisions whether you want to invest in direct stocks whether you want to invest in international mutual funds right so as uh you could see in the screen and for uh people tuning in through the podcast who are not able to see basically direct stocks are taxed very differently from international mutual funds right from a longer term capital gain perspective the holding period at a direct stock level is 2 years so after 2 years basically you are taxed at 20% post indexation indexation is simply adjusting the cost of the purchase to inflation so the effective tax rate after 2 years will come at about 14-15% roughly short term capital gains again that's under 2 years that's if you basically sell stocks uh, before 2 years you are taxed at whatever slab uh, that you are taxed at mar- the marginal level uh um, dividend income again is taxed at whatever tax slab you are so that's at the direct stocks where the holding period is of 2 years right so anything over 2 years you are taxed at 20% post indexation below 2 years you are taxed at your marginal tax slab international mutual funds are different in that they are taxed as debt funds in india right and not as equity funds so again the holding period here is 3 years so if you want to avail that beneficial tax taxation of 20% post indexation you need to at least hold these funds for 3 years and if you sell these funds prior to 3 years then you are taxed at your marginal uh, tax slab so this is something that you need to really keep in mind that direct stocks have a little bit of an edge over here due to the favorable taxation and the holding period of 2 years compared to 3 years for international mutual funds understood well you've holistically explained on uh, everything about you know investing internationally but if there were a few points that you would like to reiterate to the audience what would they be so again there are three points that i would like everyone to remember and take away from uh, this uh, podcast right number one invest based on your overall equity asset allocation just because something is looking i would say attractive from a return point of view do not go overboard of that right always try to stick to a level which you are comfortable from a risk point of view so as i pointed out again from an equity portfolio perspective having an exposure of about 10 to 15% to these funds would suffice uh, at a portfolio level number 2 is consider the tax implications for all of your investments i think that's really important a lot of the investors actually tend to miss how tax actually significantly impacts their returns so take a look at the taxation and do not get into the habit of actively joining portfolios because that could be detrimental to your returns and number 3 is keep a close eye on the impact of brokerage and currency charges so always keep that in mind uh, because that could also have a significant impact on your transactions compared to let's say investing in mutual funds because uh, again investing in direct stocks tend to uh, i would say impact uh, from a brokerage and a currency point of view so these are the three things that you need to keep in mind when you are investing in internationally all right got it uh varun if possible could you you know tell us something about the uh, top you know um funds to invest internationally 
so the, this is something that I had kept for the last, right? And again, this is something more of a trivia where we talk about the five biggest international funds in India today, which are invest, investing internationally. And as you can see, I think I would say five out of five invest in US, given I would say the depth of the markets over there. So the biggest fund in India today, which invests internationally, is the Motila Lospal Nasdaq. 100 fund of fund, which has an assets under management of over 3,000 crores, right? So this fund effectively invests in a fund outside, uh, which further invests in the NASDAQ 100. And I think, as you can see, four out of the five funds are actually passive index funds, where they are taking exposure to the U.S. markets uh, through a uh, index fund. Uh, and only the second fund, the Franklin India uh, uh, feeder, uh, is a bit different because, again, they, they have a bit, bit of a mix of a growth and value. But again, five out of five are funds which are investing uh, in the U.S. market. So I hope this sort of like gives you uh, how far along we have come in the process of investing internationally, uh, given the depth of the market. But there is definitely significant uh, amount of uh, headroom available in front of us to do that. I definitely got to learn a lot today. And uh, I hope so did our audience. Thank you so much and I'll see you again next week. Thank you so much everyone for joining.